Mm -hmm. All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the September 20th, 2021 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a, or a board committee meeting be held remotely or in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by listening to, excuse me, by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion where applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy of the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, if you would, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Coffey? Present. Mr. Offerman? Present. Ms. Scott? Present. Mr. Thomas? Present. Thank you. Do you have a quorum? Thank you. Are there any other board members in attendance who we did not call? Yes, Ms. Scott, this is Molly. Oh, thank you, Ms. Jose. Are there any other board members? Okay. I thought I saw Ms. Rowe, did you join us? Perhaps not, okay, great. So, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut anyone off. I do not see Ms. Rowe on the line now. Uh, but before the committee gets started, just wanted to make sure the committee was aware um, there's been a request from board member Hen that uh, policy 8210 uh, be removed from this afternoon's agenda. Hmm, okay. Do we, would we determine that now or would we continue taking um, the roll? Because we haven't done the roll call to see how many staff were present. Uh, the only staff who are present today who will be participating are uh, Ms. Clark and yours truly. Mr. Corns is the uh, the hand behind the scenes keeping everything running. And I do see Ms. Rowe has logged in. Okay. So Ms. Rowe has joined us as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Sorry, just wanted to get clarification and also welcome Christian, Mr. Christian Thomas to his first PRC meeting. I should have started with that. So welcome Christian. Um, okay. And you said that Mrs. Hen, um, is Ms. Hen on or she sent an email? The, it looks like it was sent the day of the meeting. Um, she sent an email. That's correct. Okay. Um, and when was that email sent today? It was sent today. Um, I do not remember the precise time. Okay. And it was asking that, and I'm scrolling down now, that policy, it was sent, somebody said at 2.54? That sounds correct. Okay. To have it removed from PRC? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Not today. Well, as, um, I think we would need to vote on that as um, Ms. Hen is not a member of PRC, and I don't see why it would need to be removed. So I, I think that's something that we probably should vote on and see um, um, if the committee would indeed like to move it. 
uh, off of, and it was just to have it moved off of this agenda? Yes, ma'am. That's the way I understood it. Okay. Okay, so um, well, was there any reasoning why or any background information or? If you give me a moment, I'll pull up the email. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we should take a vote on um, whether or not we um, should have removed. I have a peer now at 8210. It's the Board Officers Elections and Terms of Office. Um, this is the purview of which we would discuss something like this. This is the appropriate venue to discuss it in PRC. So, um, you know, if a committee member would like to make a motion to um, bring this to a vote, um, we could go ahead and do that, or I, I could um, make the motion to um, bring this to a vote. Mm -hmm. You can certainly ask for consensus, um, but I, I, it's been pointed out, ma'am, uh, for your information, there are seven board members present. While this so committee meeting has been, you have a quorum of the board. So while so then, this meeting has been announced as and is being publicized as a PRC meeting, it has not been announced, nor has it been publicized as a board meeting. You now have so a, then a board, board member. Members. Okay, so we now have a quorum of the board. Who is the seventh member, the last member to come on? I was not keeping track. I would have to ask Ms. Clark or Mr. Corns if they're aware. Okay, so we need, um, I would suggest the last board member who came on to drop off of the call so that we can continue with the committee meeting. And when I went through and uh, asked for board members to announce themselves, I did not see it as a quorum. Um, Ms. Howie. Did you? Is that Ms. Christian Thomas? Yes. Oh, sorry, Ms. Scott. Uh, well, Christian, we can't really deliberate. We have a quorum now of the board. I, I was just wondering, uh, did you count Ms. Scott twice, Ms. Howie, uh, with her phone number and her uh, her account number? Because w when I counted it, I counted uh, Ms. Rowe, Mr. Offerman, Mr. Thomas, myself, Ms. Causey, Ms. Scott, and Ms. Hen, which was and six. Ms. Ms. Joes is seven. Oh, sorry, not Ms. Hen, Ms. Joes was the sixth person. So let's count again. One, two, three, four, five, six. You are correct. I stand corrected. Thank you for that, Christian. So you, I was counted twice. <laughs> so should I, um, do I need to drop off of one of the others that, um, okay no, for me? No, ma'am. That was my error. So um, you can simply ask for consensus of the committee if they wish to change the agenda or entertain a motion. I did see uh, something in the chat uh, from Ms. Causey. Okay, um, so I'd say consensus of the committee. Um, if anyone would like to say anything on the committee as to whether or not they feel this should stay on or come off. Um, Ms. Causey, did you have a statement you would like to make? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to, um, in, in order to have discussion, make a motion to postpone policy 8210 to the next PRC meeting. Is there a second? Okay, hearing none, um, that motion fails. Um, looks like Mr. Thomas, you said you have a statement? Uh my statement was going to be that uh, I do not believe we should uh, postpone this uh, policy on the agenda. But as the motion failed, um, I guess my statement was not needed anymore. Okay. All right. Um, and I will weigh in. I don't feel that we should postpone, and I think this is the appropriate place for it. And um, I feel that so, that is one of the things that came back in our finding that things are post. This board postpones a lot of things. So um, I think so, that this is the appropriate place and time to process. So members of the board, um, by indicating why you believe a motion should not be entertained, you are essentially seconding a motion. 
um, because you're discussing the motion that was proposed while not formally seconded, the discussion of why something shouldn't be postponed is essentially a discussion of the motion. Um, so uh, my recommendation would be that you just go ahead and process the motion. Okay, so we can go ahead and process the motion um, for those in favor with that they, um, so let me make sure that we have this correct then so we can process the motion. If you are in favor of the, um, uh, it is 8210, staying on the agenda, you would vote in the affirmative, you would vote yes. If you are um, in favor of the coming off, you would, and going to the next meeting, or do I have that backwards? My understanding was that the motion was to postpone AT210 to the next board meeting. So okay, so if you agree, it would be yes, postpone, but if you want to process it today, you would vote now. Okay. All right, so if we could take a vote, please. I believe Ms. Causey has a question or comment. Okay, I thought we'd had enough comment or questions. Um, sure, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, I was just going to point out that the agenda for this meeting this afternoon um, was published Friday afternoon. Um, so there was not a lot of time for board members, um, including me, to uh, work through the um, different documents and then also to request information from staff and receive information from staff. Um, also, particularly to this um, policy, I have some documents that I had um, prepared for um, consideration by the board in the board handbook um, and at another time that I would um, have sent ahead of time if I had had more time. So in any case, I think there's, I think there's uh, some indications that would be helpful to postpone it, um, but if it's processed, we can process it and see what the committee thinks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, is it appropriate now to vote? Yes, ma'am. You can ask if there's any further debate. Is there any further debate? A uh, point of clarity. For this, uh, if we do take a vote on the motion, voting in the affirmative is saying that we are in support of postponing. The, Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So if we vote yes, you're in favor of postponing. If you vote Correct. no, you're in favor of processing it today. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we could take a vote, please, Ms. Clark. Sure. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Thomas? No. Ms. Scott? No. Motion fails. Okay. Thank you for that. So now we will start at the top. And um, it is the quorum being present will begin with policy 8221 board officers chair and vice chair duties thank you members of the committee policy 8221 is being returned to you today it was returned from uh, the board specifically to um, allow the committee to further discuss how to define or whether or not to define further the term spokesperson um, of the board and the role of the chair as spokesperson. In the policies that are cited in the policy analysis, specifically in uh, the Howard County Board of Education, uh, spokesperson is indicated and named, but it is not further defined in that policy. Additionally, there was discussion and concern at the uh, board level about the um, the board chair being able to discipline uh, individual members of the board. As a result, uh, staff have added language uh, that is in subsection 2B3. Uh, the board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. So that was added for the board's consideration. As you're aware as well, members of the committee, um, staff is trying to make sure 
that you have as many resources at your immediate disposal to make decisions and to discuss the policies. So we, so we have provided another document. It's entitled Addendum for the September 20th PRC meeting, and that uh, encapsulates the concepts that were uh, referenced uh, that I just talked about and gives you sample languages from other policy statements, specifically Howard County, St. Mary's County. Um, that's on page one of that document. Then uh, Wicomico County as well and Worcester. Um, finally, there are direct responses to board member comments that were made on March 23rd, and those are included on page three. Thank you for that, Ms. Hallie. And I think um, I was reading through and I just wanted to, oh, um, board members, anyone, I'm sorry, who has questions, I can see the chat. So please, if you have a question, um, put it in chat. And um, thank you, John, for that, for prompting me if there's anyone um, that I don't see. So, sorry. Okay, um, I'll just start. Uh, I thought this was useful in that the responses to board member comments on, on page three, it showed the question and then um, based on the comment, what staff have added. And so that to me, I was able to see exactly what was asked and then what you added and where it was. So um, I didn't have to go searching for it or wonder if it was added. And those were the salient points that I saw. And um, I didn't really have additional comments or questions because it looked like the ones that were discussed were added. Um, so I wanted to make sure I get committee member questions and then any questions um, that um, our visiting board members um, may have. So we have first from Mr. Thomas and then it looks like um, Ms. Rowe. Yeah, so go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, so with, with the addition uh, of uh, subsection 2B3, um, I know there was a point raised last meeting about how if we are, you know, if the board as a whole is reviewing each incident and whether or not it, the, the board would have the authority to censor someone or to, uh, any form of discipline would be imposed, that would take a lot of time from the board and processing things that are actually important to students and are going to be prioritizing the student needs on the board. And so my question is, would it be better if we just kind of addressed any of the discipline matters in the board handbook that's being established? And instead, we maybe referenced the board handbook and said, uh, you know, we can direct or any disciplinary or if if this policy is violated can be determined by the board handbook um just so that we would kind of not spend so much time as board members deliberating and discussing and it, something like this so if i understand your question correctly um you're asking whether or not the handbook should enumerate more precisely what possible violations are Yes. And even if the handbook does enumerate what those violations are, it uh, I don't think would be the uh, would necessarily have an exhaustive list. So it's possible that even if it's. Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. Oh. Did we just lose Miss Margaret Ann? Miss Howie, are you still there? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, Miss Scott, we can hear you okay. Um, I can also not hear Miss Howie. Oh. Um, can anyone else hear Miss Howie? I like I said, I've been having um uh issues with um the internet. I didn't know if anyone else was. I cannot hear her at all, Offerman. Okay. Oh, thank you for that, Mr. L. Okay, so it looks like there's something um, with Ms. Howie. Um, is um, Ms. Clark, is there someone else from Ms. Howie's office that can um, speak to this or is she still on? Oh, wow, it looks like, uh... Uh, Mr. Corns also left. 
Uh, I just saw that. Yeah. Oh. It looks like it's just us board members. Are we all alone? Nope. No, it's, it says we're still live. Um, maybe something. Hi, Mr. No, Burns. we can't hear you, Mr. Corn. Okay. Sorry, it looks like we were having some technical difficulties. Um, Board members, are you able to hear me now? We can, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Is there anything I'm going? I, I don't know what's going on at Greenwood, uh, but thank you for your patience. I appreciate that. Um, so to continue to answer Mr. Thomas's question, Mr. Thomas, even if you enumerate in the handbook exactly what the um, infractions are, it is still possible that the board would have to consider whether or not um, a specific board member has violated the board handbook or the board policy. Thank you. Um, and when I, I was reviewing this policy, I went back to some other policies to see if we had any other uh, violations or um, consequences outlined in other policy. And uh, there really wasn't in any other policy that I saw. So that's why I was wondering if maybe a handbook that like addressed all of that would be a better approach than putting it in specific policies because it you know, isn't in all of our policies, but it's in, it's in some of them. Um, I leave that to the board's um, desire. Uh, if the if PRC believes that it's better to defer to the uh, the handbook, uh, at the very least, the board would still need some sort of mechanism for determining whether or not the handbook or the policy, whatever you determine, has been violated. Uh, that's one of the reasons why staff added the um, board member misconduct cases so that you would have an example of how in other local boards, other local boards have addressed what they perceive and what they deem to be board member misconduct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Looks like there's a question from Ms. Clausey. Ms. Clausey? Oh no, did we? Did we lose Ms. Causey? I do not see her listed any longer. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Oh, boy. Um, hopefully she can get back on. Um, does, um, were there any other questions while we um, wait for Ms. Causey to get back on um, from any other board members? Um, I, I'm happy to read my statement until she comes back. Now I, this is a statement on 8221. Yes, this is Lily okay. Rowe. I had some comments on that policy and yep, go ahead. Um, I'll just submit them all at once for your consideration. So um, for 8221, the policy does not make clear that the chair can only execute documents after they have been approved by the board. And I did not know if that should be articulated explicitly in line 18 where it says execute documents approved by the board i think would be better language than execute documents on behalf of the board um, the next point is the policy does not make clear as spokesperson the chair can only take positions already reflected in board action through a vote and not espouse one's own individual opinion which may or may not reflect the action of the full board um, my next po uh, point is the policy should state that individual board members can state their own opinions as long as they state um, that these are their own opinions and they are not speaking for the full board. And for section B um, three, page two, line one, I think required more clarification as to the procedures for holding um, a censure vote because there doesn't appear to be due process and this does not appear to involve our ethics committee at all. And, um, you know, for instance, is a member required to be present? Um, is it a majority or a super majority? What is the proper notice to the individual being censured? Are they entitled to appeal? Are they entitled to counsel? To, to whom 
um, is removal recommended? So is it the governor? Is it the state board? And how many members are required to convene a hearing for a censure vote? And how do we prevent the consequences um, from this clause from turning into a sort of tyranny of the majority situation where a minority viewpoint is punished with censure hearings? So I guess my biggest concern is that in state law, there already exists some various things. Um, and in Robert's rules, there exists some various things. But when we start saying that the full board has the authority to censure an individual without enumerating what the due process for that individual is, then I think we could get into a situation where we could be denying people's rights and setting ourselves up for some kind of a lawsuit because Theoretically, if you had someone who had an unpopular viewpoint and the board, instead of dealing with the viewpoint, for instance, kept, if you only needed seven votes, you could keep censuring the person over and over and over again. And I know that um, this policy has to apply to all boards in the future, all members of all boards, and there are quite often in history civil liberties have been different things that not everyone has wanted to protect at every time. So I think that we need to very carefully consider that if we're going to put some language in there on enforcement, that we put all of the language either in the handbook or here somewhere that outlines a person's entire rights. Because you're talking about censuring someone appointed by the governor who's an elected official or elected officials. And I know they have rights to appeal to the state board, but then where's the beginning and the end of this, I guess, is my main point. And that's all I have to say on this policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, for joining us and sharing that. Um, we had a um, comment, it looks like, from Ms. Jones. Oh, it looks like Ms. Causey just got back in. So um, we'll have Ms. Jones and then um, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Since I'm not on the committee, I'll keep it brief. Uh, my concern is we understand that the board chair is the official spokesperson and every individual board member can speak on his or her behalf as long as they're stating they are an individual board member. The, the concern has been, uh, like Ms. Rowe pointed out, if there is a faction on the board of a certain four or five members going off and saying we're speaking on behalf of certain members of the board. And therein lies the problem when you form a group within the board which violates policy 80 through 60. Um, you can speak on your behalf, but you can't say you have you, you have the backing of six members or seven members, if especially a motion has not been passed or an action has not been taken by the board as a whole. Um, I also want to point out that the handbook is always superseded by policy. So to expect the handbook to do enforcement is not uh, fair. So I think it has to be in policy. The handbook is just a handbook, a guidebook. I don't think we can enforce. Uh, and I don't that's for a question from Ms. Howie. If we could put in something like that, it would be superseded by a policy. So thank you for that, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Chills. Um, did you want to respond, Ms. Howie, or? So um, with so thank you, ma'am. If the question is whether or not the, the policy has more authority or more weight than the handbook depends on which document or to which to which document you're referring. If um, the board agrees to be bound by the handbook, then the handbook in those cases would have the same authority as policy. If, however, there is a policy that is in conflict with the handbook, then yes, the, the the policy would supersede the handbook. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Harry. Sure. Okay, and next is uh, Ms. Causey. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just ask um, if um, Ms. Howie or other staff could respond to Lily's um, comments and questions. So uh, with, after that, uh, section 20, no, I believe it's section 19 
of uh, Roberts addresses discipline of members. If um, the board wishes to use that as an exemplar in terms of when notice is provided to um, individual members about possible censure. Uh, but the reason that the cases were provided to the committee and to the board was to give you uh, what has been done in other LEAs. I believe Dorchester, uh, Washington, Prince George's are the most recent examples, uh, Talbot being another example when that board was appointed. Um, so whether or not, let me address the questions sort of um, in the reverse, whether or not uh, the, um, the board has the authority to censure, the board absolutely has the authority to censure a board member, and that's clear from the cases that have been cited. Whether or not you want to provide specific procedures or refer to the procedures that are in Roberts, that is certainly up to the board, but given that you're um, guided by and your parliamentary authority is RONR, um, they're incorporated by reference to that extent. Uh, as to whether or not individual board members can state their own opinions, um, I don't believe that this policy um, addresses opinions of board members. Um, and whether or not uh, it makes clear that the chair can only execute documents after approved by the board, uh, if that is something that the committee wishes added, uh, the committee can certainly make that motion. And I think I responded to the questions that, or the comments that were presented. If I missed something, that is my error. Okay. Did you have a question, Ms. Closing? Yes, thank you for all of that, Ms. Howie. Um, and I also appreciate the um, Policy 8221 addendum for September 20th um, for today's meeting, because um, as you pointed out, there was a lot of good information that was um, collected by your office um, for the policies, uh, for the, the PRC's review and also for uh, additional board members that wanted to access it through board docs. Um, so in Robert's rules, section 19, is it a two thirds vote for censure? And I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Um, the other, um, well, it's not really a question. Um, I'd like to, as you as you said, this the, our policy does not speak to a number of things. Um, regarding uh, board members concerns. Um, but as you pointed out, there are several other counties that have um, some more clarification in in their in their policies. Um, so if if I thought it was helpful to add that, would I just make a motion to add the language that you've submitted to the committee, the sample language from other districts? If you believe it's helpful, um, which point language? Of, can I get a point you, of clarification just because I'm confused? Um, Ms. Howie, I thought you said you already included some language in here from other um, districts. So the, uh, the language that was included was not from another um, school system or local board of education. Um, it was a language that was recommended uh, for other policies in the 8000 series, and that is it's in paragraph 2B3 lines, lines 1 to 4. The board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. So there was some language included. Um, yes, in that. that's and not then from another um, LEA. And also there was language um, that was included based on the questions raised from board members. I, I saw that included in here. So yeah, that was just my question. I just wanted to be clear um, on that. Um, but it sounds like um, Ms. Calls, you said you had a question about a motion? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I would like to uh, make a motion to add additional language that was provided on page one of the addendum for September 20, 2021 PRC meeting that I, that I think would be helpful. So um, I'd like to add the language in paragraph 2A, and <clears throat> that's in the document that was provided by um, staff because of the, the authority of the board is collective and not individual, an individual board member cannot act on behalf of the board or represent the authority of the board unless so authorized by the full board. Additional um, is as public representatives of the community and of the school system, individual board members are responsible for conducting themselves in a professional manner at all times in adherence to board policies and national school boards association standards and professional standards of boardmanship. And their sentence goes on, alleged violations will be handled in accordance with the procedures identified in the Board of Education of, this is Howard County, but it would then say the Baltimore County Handbook. Okay. Is there a second to Ms. Clausey's motion? Uh, second, Thomas. Okay. If we could do a vote, please. Uh, can we have... We vote before or after discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if there's discussion, then um, we have that first and then we vote. OK, uh, I'd like to make a comment. Certainly. OK, um, I think that if we, with the handbook, uh, as Ms. Howie suggested as possible, uh, agreed to bound ourselves to the handbook as a full board and uh, was able to, and if we were able to kind of make that equal to policy, I think the handbook would provide a much more organized approach to how we're how we are handling consequences to board members or disciplinary action for board members. Um, as I said before, when looking through the policies, I was trying to see if there were any other consequences, consequences or disciplinary action in other policies, and I didn't see much. And I think with a lot of our policies, some things like there, there needs to be like a, a kind of overview of all of our policies to kind of set, make a standard, I guess, for for certain yeah. things. And I think by creating a handbook that would outline the consequences and writing our consequences, uh, saying in, in this policy that we were going to refer to the consequences in a handbook, then um, that would be the best way to approach that. But uh, Ms. Joes, um, as you are someone who's been working on the handbook, do you believe that that is something that we could possibly do? Do you believe that our handbook could enforce rules like this and other rules for board members? Ms. Jose, are you still there? Is she still on? I see her phone number uh, displayed. Hello? If you're still here, me? Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Christian, could you repeat your question? Yes. Um, Ms. Joes, as someone who's been actively involved in creating the handbook uh, and, and working on it for the past few months now, uh, do you think that we could uh, address some of these consequences for board members or disciplinary action board members in the handbook? Do you think that, that that's something that we could do instead of trying to address it in kind of individual policies throughout something having, uh, you know, a concise, consistent handbook to look back on with consequences present? Um, do you think that we could do we could add that to the handbook and that could be something that we possibly do? So it's going to be up to the uh, I, do, I do want to add up Ms. Thomas, that we've been working on this handbook since 2019. It's been kind of done. We are going to reference policies, and the policy and PRC committee meets every month, and you can update policies, and they'll keep getting updated. So we cannot keep going back and forth with the handbook. We did make a recommendation as a committee that the handbook be updated every three to four years. So the next board that comes in has to update it in the next couple of years. So we are kind of done. I don't see us going back into the, to the drawing board other than making just minor edits. Um, the policies will have to be updated and kept abreast, especially when it comes to um, action items for implementing something like censure. It has to be uh, fortified, I believe, in policy. 
And Ms. Joe, she said, how long have you all been working on that handbook? Because I know it's in the, in the process. How long? You said 2019? So two years? Yes. Uh, Ms. Hen was the chair of that hat off, and she left a few months later. Um, I became the chair. Ms. Causey came in. She was the vice chair, and she left, um, I believe, January of this year. So it's been kind of like an open door for people going in and out, and that's why I don't think ad hoc are um, essentially effective. But we, I think Ms. Gower, Ms. Pastor, and I have done the best with what we've had, and I really think we need to move forward with, forward with that and not uh, keep pushing it back because it is one of the findings from the efficiency report as well as the OIG's office that we need to have a handbook and um, as always policy will supersede the handbook so maybe we could make a few changes Mr. Thomas to answer your question but no we're not going to go back to the drawing board and, and just undo everything. So Thank you Mr. I'm sorry, members of the committee, uh, perhaps I missed it, and I do see a question as well in the chat, but Ms. Causey, I do not see where you wanted the language uh, that you've proposed added. I did not, I'm sorry, I did not hear that in your motion. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I would defer to staff to insert it in the proper location. Okay. So you're just, so that we understand, you're wanting, this is Ms. Scott, you're wanting to add the language, but you have no preference as to where it is added. That's correct. Okay. Okay, all right, um, was there any other discussion or questions or are we ready for the vote? to add this language into the policy. And it is the, uh, the sample language um, from, let's see, the policy from the addendum for September 20th. And it was uh, everything under bullet two item A, really. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, any additional um, questions? Sorry. Uh, oh, Ms. Scott, may I address my comment? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, if this amendment is to fail, uh, I guess my concern would be if and I, I, don't, I don't agree with the language of the amendment. I, I think it's, it's where the section should be. I think we should determine that here or, or kind of make that determination. I think this language is important. Um, but if this amendment was to fail, and then let's say there wasn't another amendment made, and PRC approved this policy again, and it went to the full board, then I feel like we'd be kind of missing the point of why it's being sent back to policy review committee if it's not going to be voted on by the full board. So I really think uh, that we should. Uh, oh, I can amend the amendment. Um, can I have a moment to kind of read over the policy and and, and try to maybe reword it to amend, amend the amendment, um, Ms. Scott, or uh, is time not allowing? So you want to have time to reread policy 8221? Uh, not necessarily, just to kind of process. Actually, I, I can make the amendment right now. Um, I guess I would amend Ms. Uh, Causey's amendment to insert the language um, creating in section two below letter A, uh, creating another letter, letter B, uh, that would kind of insert that language about, uh, because the authority of the board is collective and not individual, an individual member cannot act on behalf of the board or represent the authority of the board unless so authorized by the full board. And to also include the language uh, that she also stated, which is as a public representative of the count community and of the school system, individual board members are responsible for conducting themselves in a manner professional and professional manner at all times in adherence to board policies and the National School Boards Association standards and professional standards of boardmanship. Alleged violations will be handled in accordance with procedures identified in the Board of Education of Baltimore County Handbook. I, I would amend the, the motion to add that in under the letter A and to remove the information in letter B, uh, the, the, the paragraph. Okay, so 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that's a little. So it, 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 it's, let, let's try to narrow so we understand yeah. okay. what exactly the committee's pleasure is so that the committee is properly processing the motion, you understand what the outcome is. And thankfully in committee, things are less formal. Uh, mm -hmm. So first of all, let's, let's understand what Ms. Causey's motion is. And Ms. Causey's motion, as I understand it, is to insert somewhere in policy 8221, the language from, sample language from the Howard County Board of Education, policy 2000. And that would be the three bullets that are referenced under subsection A, page one of the addendum. Would that be accurate, Mrs. Causey? Yes, Ms. Howie. Okay, so, uh, but the, the insertion point is not part of your motion. It's just to add to, it's to amend the policy to add this language at some point. Yes, Ms. Howie, except okay. we already have the statement the chairman shall serve as a spokesperson for the board. So I did not ask to add that. Okay. So oh, that's good. Yes, yeah, we do already have that. Mm -hmm. It would just be uh, bullets one and three. So that's, so the motion is to insert. Correct? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So, and then Mr. Mr. Thomas's motion was to amend your amendment and to, and when you amend an amendment, you can do something to the language. So you can either strike it out, you can, but you have to, to restrict it to the language that's being, um, that's being proposed for amendment. So all Mr. Thomas's, um, amendment, all his motion can do as a secondary amendment is something to the language you've already proposed. But again, given that we are in committee and committee is less formal um, in order to uh, promote discussion, Mr. Thomas's amendment was where to insert. Mm -hmm. So not to change any of the language, but it was where to insert. Is that accurate, Mr. Thomas? It, that was my initial intention was to where to insert and then as figuring out where to insert, I was thinking it might be ideal to strike out uh, like paragraph B and then I keep reading that B2 it, and now that I'm keeping it is B2 maybe strike out the information about uh, the different consequences that would follow because I believe uh, the insertion that Miss Okay, so, well, yeah, but I can't do that because I can't amend. You can't do that because your amendment, your secondary amendment, is limited to the language of the primary amendment. So mm -hmm. what you can do is come back after the second, after Ms. Causey's amendment is processed, and recommend further amendments to AT221. But you can't, within your one amendment, your secondary amendment change something that's not part of the primary amendment, if that makes sense. That does. OK, so okay. I uh, move to amend Ms. Causey's amendment to insert her language after B, after Section 2, B, 1. So that would be uh, after the sentence, only the board chair has the right to speak on behalf of the board, and then another number, number two, and then it would state Ms. Causey has, has. So your amendment uh, would be to place uh, what is currently 2A bullet 1 from the addendum uh, as number 2 of B1 um, 2. And what is the third bullet? as number three. Would that be accurate? Uh, what would the number be for the inserted language? So you indicated you wanted inserted after number one. Mm -hmm. So that would make bullet one, number two, and bullet three, 
number three. I'm having trouble visualizing. Um, okay. So B1 indicates only the board chair has the right to speak on behalf of the board. Mm -hmm. If I understood the motion correctly, then B2 would be because the authority of the board is collective and not individual, an individual board member cannot act on behalf of the board or represent the authority of the board unless so authorized by the full board. That is correct. OK, so that would be the new number two and uh, your amendment then and Ms. Causey clarified that her amendment did not include the second bullet. So the third bullet would become the new number three uh, as a public as public representatives of the community. That would be number three, that bullet. That is perfect. Thank you so much, Ms. Howie. You're welcome. Thank you board members for bearing with me as I'm still learning the procedures. We learned. We learn a lot. Miss Howie's a great teacher. <laughs> um, okay, so basically, yeah, Miss Rose said it. You're doing great, Christian. Don't even worry <laughs> about it. So um, basically, um, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas's amendment to the amendment basically was placement, like you said, Miss Howie. Correct, and then um, Miss Calzies is the language minus bullet two. I just wanted to recap just in case there was anyone else. Um, it looks like there is a question from Mr. Offerman. Ms. Halley. Um, yes, sir. Since, since this section is entitled duties of the chair and the vice chair, uh, is this the right place to put all these, uh, uh, all this, uh, all, all this content in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, all the uh, all the uh, uh, board members, or does it belong somewhere else? So, if you'd like it in a different policy, uh, as opposed to policy eighty two twenty one, but the the initial um, uh, amendments from staff and discussion was that violations of the chair's um, authority be placed in or the board's authority be placed in this policy. But yes, if the board would rather see it somewhere else, that's completely up to the board. No, that's OK. Thank you. Just asking. Sure. Thank you. And um, my only other question, and then I guess we can take the vote, is this. Um, I just need a clarification with the second bullet where it's because the authority of the board is collective and not individual, an individual board member cannot act on behalf of the board or represent the authority of the board unless so authorized by the board. So would that impact, like, let's say if um, there's an event or something, and as chair, um, I'd like uh, another board member perhaps from that area to go to that event, would that have to then be approved by the full board? Is that how that's interpreted? That wouldn't be how I would interpret it, but my interpretation is clearly secondary to the board's interpretation. If there is, for example, if um, a member of, if the board chair or vice chair is not available for certain duties that have already been approved by the full board, then I believe that the, this particular section would apply. That had already been approved by the full board. Okay. Well, again, okay. that is uh, this is an individual acting on behalf of the board. Oh, I, I okay. I see the difference now. Okay, and my only other question was the last part. Um, as you mentioned, handbooks. Uh, right now, we don't have. Um, uh, thank you for that, Miss Rowe. Um, it doesn't look like we have anything in the handbook unless I could be wrong, that discusses consequences or violations of consequences. So um, would bullet three be appropriate then? Because we don't, it, it's referencing the handbook and there's nothing in the handbook that addresses that. Or would they then just add this language to the handbook? I just, I'm a little confused. So that is correct. There would have to be some sort of procedures in your handbook about how to handle violations of board member conduct. Okay. 
could the handbook, because I'd hate to, it's been two years, and I, I'd hate to, is, is this something, this policy, could this policy be like an insert in the handbook, and then that would be, would that suffice, or would it have to be addition? Because this outlines it along with the policy. Um, Ms. Scott, sorry. if I may. I'm sorry, who was speaking? Scott, this is Ms. Jones. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm glad you're on. Go ahead as the chair. We'll be happy to insert that language, but I think board members need to be aware that we were waiting on the PRC and policies to finalize the handbook. So it's kind of, we're going around in circles. Um, we couldn't put in any language in terms of implementation because members of the board had objections to it since it wasn't in policy. But now what I'm hearing is that you want it in the handbook, not so much in policy. So I think we need to clarify that the handbook is going to undergo whatever the policy we're going to put in there. But I'll be happy to add language. I don't see that as a huge uh, effort on our part okay. um, and reference the policy. That's what I was thinking, putting this language, as Ms. Calsey suggested, um, in policy and then putting the policy in the handbook so that the hand book undergirds the policy. Um, that's that's what I, I just didn't want it to, like you said, go in a roundabout in a circle, and then I didn't want to create more um, of an issue. So um, do we have any um, other questions or anything in regards to that? Or Ms. Howie, anything else to suggest? Or are we ready for the vote? Um, I had a Yes. Who had a question? I saw Ms. Howie was speaking. Um, I, I have a comment. But okay. Ms. Howie was speaking. Um, I, I just think that uh, if we... I, I'm inclined to take the... Um, Ms. Ms. Joes has been the person who's working on the handbook, so I'm inclined to take her view of the handbook, uh, uh, seeing it as something that does not supersede policy, but incorporates policy into it. Um, and, I, and so... I, I'm beginning to realize that maybe that language uh, in the handbook. If we put it in this policy, I, I'm just kind of concerned that like it's if it's in the handbook, then it's going to be in the other policy. And I, I don't know, just it's very confusing. And I, I think I, I would much rather see it in one area that isn't just referencing the policy, like the handbook that all policies could then address, um, just because I think that would be easier. But um, Ms. Joes uh, is the chair of the Handbook Ad Hoc Committee, and so I, I think her view of the handbook it would be of uh, more importance than mine. All views are important. That's why we have committees where we hash these things out. So um, are we now ready for the vote? Okay. Ms. Clark, are you there? If you could take a, a vote um, on Christian's Amendment to the amendment to add the language um, suggested by Ms. Causey. Um, it's number policy 8221, um, addendum for September 20th, um, number two, uh, lines under A, one, and three. Correct. So adding it to, I'm sorry. Yes, did I have this here a second to um, Mr. Thomas's motion? Oh, there was not. I'm sorry. It sounds like it went into discussion. Um, is there a second to Mr. Thomas's motion? Mr. Thomas, uh, for us, could you repeat it if, um, where you wanted the language added? Sure. Uh, so my amendment uh, was to move that Ms. Causey's amendment language be added after paragraph 2B1 making it number two under the individual board member violations thing and, and, and the second bullet point number three. Okay, is there a second? Ms. Causey is seconded. Okay, she put it in chat, thank you. That was seconded by Ms. Causey. Okay, um, uh, if we could take a roll call vote. And Ms., um, just for the record, Ms. Howie, is that okay if someone should lose their audio abilities that they can put their vote or their second in the chat? Is that okay? 
as long as members are able to hear and participate contemporaneously. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify. All right. And um, yep, if we could, it has been moved and seconded. If we could take a vote, please. So, Ms. Causey? Yes, I, I am here now. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. And Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay, four in favor. Okay, and now we will vote on Ms. Causey's amendment to add the language um, to the policy. Uh, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Four in favor. Great. All right, thank you. Okay. So we have and on. now a vote mm -hmm. on the policy as amended, whether or not the committee wishes to recommend that the policy as amended uh, proceed to the full board. Madam oh, Chair, please. I'd like to offer one more amendment to policy 8221, please. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I put it in the chat. I move to amend policy 8221, page one, to change line 18 to read, execute documents approved by the board. A point of clarity. Mm -hmm. If we are saying execute documents approved by the board, does that include uh, maybe press releases that the chair would be sending out on behalf of the board? Uh, and like, so let's say, uh, there is something that's happening. Uh, would we have to, the board have to assemble and all vote on a press release that would be made, uh, instantane need to be made immediately? Yep. So my, Excuse may me. I respond, Madam Chair? Yeah. Excuse me. Does this, oh. motion, does, does this motion have to be seconded? Yes, this motion requires a second before we um, uh, actually um, engage in discussion. So the motion was made. Um, is there a second? Second, Thomas. Okay. And yes, Ms. Causey, you may speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, this, this, I believe, is appropriate language uh, for documents, and those would be related to contracts or other um, documents that the board chair is asked to sign. Um, I do not believe it would relate to press releases because in the same policy, we're saying that the uh, chair of the board does have the uh, opportunity to be the spokesperson and that those press releases are not documents that are signed. Okay. Um, Ms. Howie, if Ms. If, um, Ms. Scott wanted, Ms. Howie could chime in to, to see if I'm correct or not. Uh, this would include, um, the way it's written, it says that you, um, it has been moved and seconded that you move to amend policy 8221 to change 18 to read execute documents approved by the board. So that means that any document, contracts, like you, like you were asking Christian, um, uh, press releases, um, the, the web, things on the web page, um, things on social media, Facebook posts, um, it, it would cover um, Sometimes uh, things that would have to come out immediately, like press releases and media advisories, and um, you know if there's an outage or something, all of that would have to be approved at and looked at by the board, board and that would create a huge, huge bottleneck. So um, I would not support um, um, that language. Uh, I feel that's why there's the system there to to do those things. So. Um, were there any other questions? So just to clarify, what I heard in the motion was basically to strike out on behalf of and insert uh, approved by. That's what's in the chat. Right, so I just wanted to make sure that, uh, so if, uh, if adopted, the line would read execute documents um, approved by the board. Is this is, that so this is Ms. Causey. Yes, that's my intention. Okay. 
So instead of the board chair approving, so I can speak to that a little bit more. That would be where there was a press release where the board chair has spoken on behalf of the board and given a statement as the spokesperson for the board. What this would do is make it so that that has to be approved by the full board. And that would create an enormous bottleneck. Um, the, uh, we are not the swiftest at approving and moving things through the board. So um, I just think that could um, cause a lot of havoc. And um, if I could, because I'm not immediately seeing it, which document is it in? You said line 18, and it's which one? The policy draft? Yes, ma'am. It's policy 8221. And it's the second one. It is not the. It would be line eighteen on um, on page one, and um, the one question that has been raised is whether or not um, when the board chair signs, uh, uh, say, uh, travel reimbursements and procure documents whether or not those documents would be included or anticipated by this particular um, section of the policy. Okay, this, I, it, again, um, I'm seeing a lot of or he hearing a lot of where they're saying, well, I don't believe or it could be interpreted or it may be it, it, things that are subjective and left to interpretation means that that um, it could be enforced willy nilly. And so that's why I think the board chair, I don't believe that that should um, uh, should should be changed because I believe it would apply to press releases, uh, social media. Um, Twitter, Facebook, um, that the right now that the staff, we have a communications department, uh, talking points, things like that, it could apply to all of those kinds of things. And I do see a question from Ms. Causey uh, in the chat about whether or not it, um, this anticipates press releases. I'm not aware of whether or not the board chair signs press releases. I know that um, there are times when the board issues press releases, whether or not the board chair does an has an official signature, I'm just not aware. There have been press releases or notices that Dr. Williams and I sent out on um, uh, uh, as chair representing the board and as Dr. Williams. So yes, if this goes in, that would pertain to that. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Madam Chair, my question is uh, for the person who initially brought this forward uh, in comment, uh, Ms. Rowe, uh, what is, for, for amending the language to kind of um, include this, uh, I, I, I almost feel as though like this is already something that the chair is held accountable for as being a board member, you know, some of these documents like, like maybe employment contracts or individual employees, those are things that are already confidential as board members. And so I, I, I'm wondering, what is the, why do you, why is it that you feel that that language is necessary to be added? What maybe fears uh, would you have for uh, future board chairs that might be uh, abusing power? Madam Chair, yes. may I Oh, good gracious. So is that your question or are you asking on behalf of Ms. Rowe? I am asking a question uh, that is to, directed to Ms. Rowe, but to you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, I wasn't sure. So you're asking it to Ms. Rowe. Okay, yes, go ahead and respond, Ms. Rowe. Okay, so we've had situations in the past where there have been questions as to whether or not a board chair or even a committee chair had the um, right to sign something. Um, and in this case, it was me as chair of the audit committee, and it was an employment contract of an employee of the audit office of internal audit and our legal counsel came forward and said no the contract has to be approved by the full board the person the board chair and the chair of audit on behalf of the board chair cannot sign an employment contract when the full board has not voted one way or the other on it and so because that was an issue that was brought up in emails and required legal counsel, 
I view the language as being on behalf of the board as being somewhat different than um, that the board has approved it because that specific instance, that language would have mattered because if you sign an employment contract of a direct report of the Board of Education on behalf of the board, that does not signify whether it's necessary for the board to approve that contract first. And I was wanting that to be specified because the opinion of our legal counsel at the time was that the board needs to approve any and all contracts that the chair would sign prior to the chair signing them. And uh, I see a couple of questions uh, in the chat and Ms. Rowe, um, pardon me, I do not recall the specific advice that was provided. I do, prov I do recall part of the question being whether or not the board chair could delegate to the audit committee chair the ability to approve uh, contracts. But given that the board uh, Audit board audit committee chair is the individual who can evaluate. I believe it's the chief auditor. As I recall, that was part of the issue as well. So yeah, because I was asked to come sign the contract. On and the board had not board. voted on the contract and I refused to sign the contract until the board voted because I did not believe I had the authority to sign the contract without a board vote. But that authority was an extension of the authority of the chair. And so the, the Mr. Brusades said in that email, and I'm happy to find it probably not right this minute, but eventually and send it to you. Mr. Brusades said in that email that yes, the board would have to vote on the contract before I would be able to sign it. And then it was brought to the board, the board voted, approved the contract, and then I signed it. Well, that um, specific situation aside, um, one thing I, I would ask Ms. Um, Howie, is there precedence for this? Because I will say I've not, I didn't hear a lot of these things prior to me becoming chair. Once I became chair, I'm hearing a lot of things that are ways where members are wanting to add more controls of the chair. Um, and it looks like in the past the board, you know, didn't have time for all the approvals they needed. So they gave that um, ability to the chair so they could function more succinctly. So my question would be, um, Ms. Howie, if, if there is, precedence for this? So the, as you can see from the policy, the policy was last revised in 2015. So it was being mm -hmm. brought for is being brought forward under 8130. This is part of the seven year review. So this is the first time in um, since the, the policy has been reviewed that these issues have been discussed. Mm -hmm. um, as to former practice, uh, and Ms. Causey has asked what it means to execute documents uh, on behalf of the board, uh, the term execute is generally understood to be a term that applies to uh, contractual obligations. But here, given that it's not asking the board chair to execute contracts, uh, the uh, the term is more broadly used. So as I said, on behalf of the board to approve procure statements, to approve requests for leave, uh, those are done without the full board uh, acting. That is simply the the board chair again in the standing in the, the place of the the full board. Okay, so it would be so then this would mean that any documents, press releases, social media, um, any kind of receipts, procurement, um, basically it would be the full board controlling the um, signing of all of those things. As, opposed as I to said, I'm, I'm not aware at this moment of uh, a process that requires the board chair to sign uh, any sort of document about social media. 
if there is a contract, for example, and you all approve contracts every, well, at least once a month, um, if there is a contract, for example, let's say applesauce, and we engage a vendor to purchase applesauce for our, um, our young people, then uh, there is going to be a contract with the board because the board has approved uh, whoever that vendor is or whoever those vendors are. And there will then be a document that evidences that the board has entered into an agreement to purchase applesauce. And that agreement is executed with the board chair signature on behalf of the board and the superintendent as secretary treasurer. And the education article does indicate that no contract can be executed without the signature of actually the superintendent. So uh, that those would definitely be the types of documents that are, are signed by the board chair in the capacity as board chair and for which the full board has provided um, its approval. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas, looks like there's a question you have. Um, yes. Um, if we, Miss Howie, if we, oh, this is directed to Miss Howie, but obviously to Miss Scott first, then could be, anyways. Um, if we were to add another, if we were to insert another uh, line that maybe said the board chair has authority to um, make public releases and uh, or social media things or any to make public statements, would that kind of um, secure the concerns that some board members have or, or would that kind of interject with what it means to be a spokesperson and uh, would that cause a lot of any would that not be correct? As you see, number six, um, the board chair serves as the official spokesperson of the board. And that would be at line 21. Okay, and do, do you think there could be any other language besides um, the proposed amending language that maybe would make it more clear that documents that need to be signed or documents that are about contracts need to be approved versus uh, public releases, maybe the board would have, the chair would have authority to kind of make those. Uh, is there other language besides uh, the initial language of the, uh, of Ms. Causey's amendment, this is approved by the board, that maybe would be more clear? If I understood exactly what issue was being addressed, I'd be able to recommend, but I'm not sure I understand precisely which issue is causing consternation um, other than contracts. And Ms., that was the example Ms. Rowe used, employment contracts. I'm just not, I, I'm a little bit adrift as to how to answer um, and advise about changing language when I'm not sure exactly which issue is being addressed. Okay, um, uh, there might be a better person to maybe articulate what that issue is, if someone else could speak to that, uh, Ms. Scott. So it sounds like, and I'm speaking from like a high level sort of, um, sort of, um, I guess sort of assessment. It sounds like what you're saying, um, you know, it, it, basically I would say that it's not, it, it's just saying approval approved by the board. There are a lot of things that the board chair signs, and that's why you have a board chair that that signs those things because the board is usually taking care of the school system, working on on other things, um, working on policies, things like that. To approve procurement and and everything, and some of the um, uh, like I said, press releases or um websites or, um, or or all kinds of things like that to have everything as you see an example not having PRC um, meetings in, uh, in committee but actually having full <laughs> PRC committees at the board meetings and what a bottleneck that is that's what would happen but think about it in terms of signing that's I'm just trying to give you 
um, an, an example of that. So I don't feel that this is something that would help us streamline our process. I don't think it would help the board move more swiftly in its process and um, be able to be more efficient as was some of the recommendations from the report. I think of anything, this would do the opposite. So um, like I said, um, there are things that I find that are like routine business items that now would have to come to the full board and, and, and we are not there every day. I come in on days when there aren't board meetings so that I can sign and do things to make sure things are moving and to wait until a board meeting and board members don't want to have meetings during the day and don't want to have it on at this time. And, you know, we can't even get board members to all show up and get a quorum at a 10 a.m. meeting, but we can all come together and approve documents. I mean, it, it just doesn't seem feasible. So I know that was a lot that I said, but um, with with everything that we're doing and everything going on, I, I, I just would not be in, in favor of this. So if anyone else would like to speak to it, please do so. If not, I think we need to um, vote and move on. Madam Chair, I had put in the chat that I had another example, if you would give me a moment. Yes, please, Ms. Caldy, go ahead. Thank you. So um, and this is an issue that came up when I was chair, um, and I think the uh, my impetus for putting the policy is to clarify um, for current and future, um, because it was an issue more of um, staff um, providing things according to past practice, um, but there was an, uh, an issue of um, memo of understanding with the county for uh, putting PAL centers alongside our schools, which we are certainly grateful for and they provide great benefits for our students and our communities, um, but it's also encumbering board property with um, facilities and also encumbering us with the, uh, with the maintaining and the use and so forth. So. I had that clarified uh, with board council at the time that I did not think it was appropriate for me uh, to sign without the board having um, reviewed the document, reviewed the the, the uh, principle of the issue and also uh, providing approval. And so that we did have that approval provided by the board. Um, I wanna say it was November of 2020. Um, so, Mr. Thomas, it was uh, before your time on the board, um, but again, it's not a, it's not about overreach. It's about clarifying processes and clarifying for board board members, but also for staff and superintendent. Uh, so that's that was um, my goal is cl just clarification for future activities. Thank you for that explanation. So okay. is the uh, is the concern that's being expressed uh, by the committee? Uh, is it um, is it mostly related to or primarily related to contracts or agreements? Was that the spirit of what it was um, suggested? That's what I'm hearing. Um, that's not. I don't think. That, I don't really have a concern about that, but it sounds like there are um, others who do. So then um, I'm wondering then if something should be put into this that would speak specifically to that. I, I, I just, I'm not really sure. I think this is going down like a slippery slope. Yes? Uh, this is Molly. I do want to point out that all contracts come to the building and contract. Um, and they are approved by the board before you sign it, including some of the MOUs. I believe they do come to the uh, through the building and contracts as well. So I don't, I don't really see what the issue is here, uh, unless it's just to bottleneck things. So I, I'm not. If you can't explain to me what the policy is for what you're amending, then you kind of lost the audience. I'm not sure what the the issue we are trying to rectify. Yeah, it looks like we're trying to rectify um, a problem that doesn't exist, but could in turn create a problem. So I'm not really sure. Um, and um, Joe, again, thank you for being on. You're also the chair of the um, building and contracts. So that um, gives a little background to, uh, uh, like you said, what's going on. 
So um, I guess we've had debate and discussion on this. Um, are we ready to now call the vote? Uh, is there an additional question, Christian? Um, I believe Ms. Causey was before me. Um, she just spoke. Were you speaking again, okay. Ms. Causey? I'll I'm defer to, to Mr. Sure Thomas. Everybody is equally heard. I'll defer to Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I, I believe I understand what, what Mr. Rose is saying, but uh, Ms. Rowe and Ms. Causey both brought up, you know, instances when the contract wasn't first go, it didn't first go to uh, the Building Conducts Committee or to another committee. It, it went to them in their roles as chair of the committee or Ms. Causey as the former board, board chair. Um, I, I think that language kind of maybe specifying contracts need to be approved or or are contracts signed by the board need to be approved by the full board. But m the concern that I had at the beginning of this was that uh, if the language that Ms. Causey has right now, I was concerned that that would stifle the board chair from being able to make public releases. And I think that the language that it's in, as Ms. Scott has said, the language does do just that. Um, and so I, if there was a way to modify that language to kind of make it known that public releases, social media, anything like that, if, if there was a way to make it to amend Miss Causey's amendment to kind of make that known that the chair has the authority to do that, then I would be in support of it. But the way that it's written right now, I think I, I'm not in support of that. Are you making, I, I'm sorry, were you making an amendment to her? Amendment? I, I, I don't have the language to kind of make that amendment. Um, I, I had, uh, that's why I kind of was trying to ask Miss Calls or Miss Howie that earlier. But uh, oh, I, I don't know what the language okay. is. Uh, so, um, Miss Calzi, <laughs> or rather, maybe Miss Howie, would it be appropriate to um, maybe then send this back to get more specific language around what um, Miss Calzi was saying to specify that it was specific to, as she and Miss Rose said, to contracts and not. Um, like social media and press releases or web or, or things like that, would that be appropriate? So, so then we would bring this back and review it again. So if the the board wishes to postpone so that um, specific language related to contracts uh, can be um, uh, clarified, then understood. Would Ms. Causey, and assuming she's amenable to it, I don't mean to. Um, Does it to, matter um, whether or not she's amenable to it? The uh, the motion to postpone um, would um, take precedence. Okay, so then I'd make a motion to postpone um, Ms. Causey's amendment so that we can add additional contract specific language um, to 8221. Do I require a second? It does is require there, a second. Is there second. a second? Second, Thomas. Thank you. That would take away some of the ambiguity, <laughs> ambiguity so that we could be more specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we are moving on. Oh, you had a, a, so you a comment, Ms. Causey? Oh, I'm need sorry. To process the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, goodness. Um, it was moved and seconded. Um, maybe take a roll call vote, please, Ms. Clark. Yes, Ms. Clark. Um, Ms. Causey. Um, I just put in the chat. I had a comment. I just wanted clarification from the chair that the is it PRC staff or is it board council that will review and create language? I was thinking PRC staff, but it, we could send it over to board council. Yes. Okay, thank sure you for that. that they're included. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Sorry, Ms. Clark. <laughs> yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Four in favor. Okay, okay, we'll return that to um, the committee. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, may we proceed? Yes. Madam Chair, 
Uh, policy 8364 is presented um, uh, next on the agenda. Uh, this, um, all of the ethics code policies were added to the 2020-2021 uh, PRC um, agenda to review last year. And uh, 8364 was the sole policy that was not um, moved forward to uh, move forward as approved to the full board and ultimately to the SEC. Um, it was sent back to PRC um, after board action on April 20th, and the board specifically asked on April 20th that the committee consider further. Um, specifically, the motion was that PRC uh, further discuss and consider language related to the retention of financial disclosure uh, forms. Um, so it's being brought back to the committee to further consider. Uh, what we have provided for you, we've looked through all of the sister LEAs and all 23 LEAs have the same retention period as four years. We also looked at the Ethics Commission of Baltimore County Government in the County Code Article 7-1-201. That retention period is also uh, four years. Um, and I'm sorry, I did not clarify. Somerset County does not have a specific four-year period noted in its policy in its board policy. However, its model policy is policy B, uh, which is the State Ethics Commission, which has a four-year retention period. So uh, as well, they have a four-year period. So in terms of discussion, that is, um, it's now in the committee's lap to further discuss. Um, I would like to mention that page five, um, starting with line one through line five, uh, is new language as well. Um, the general provisions article 5606, which was part of Senate Bill 850 during the 2019 section, the corrections bill uh, included this language, which designates that a person's home address in a financial disclosure statement is not to be released. Uh, you have in the addendum, uh, to uh, this policy responses to comments that were made and questions that were posed at the April 20th meeting. Uh, Ms. Hen asked um, about discussion for strengthening the policy uh, that was in the consultant's report. The eMERGE consultant report indicates that uh, financial disclosure statements that were disposed of were done consistent with policy 8364. Ms. Hen's comment as well about UHY making a recommendation concerning the retention schedule and evaluation. That was not precisely the, evalu the uh, recommendation. The recommendation was actually about annual mandatory training and that all individuals be encouraged to file on time. Uh, there was a question about the, uh, the training that should be conducted and why that wasn't in this policy. That is in policy 8366 concerning your ethics panel. Uh, and then there were questions again about uh, home address. And as I indicated, that was, uh, that's addressed in um, paragraph five, section E at page five of the current draft. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you um, for this. And it looks like we do have some questions. Um, I, I can um, go ahead and start. And then next is Ms. Causey. It looks like the time for retention from, you said from LEAs, um, the State Ethics Commission, and then even you said Somerset County and, and um, other um, areas they use four years. Is that the, the same time schedule that we are currently on now, four years? Yes, ma'am. We currently have four years, but again, uh, this was returned to the committee to discuss whether or not you wanted another retention period. That was the specific motion. So okay. that's in the committee's purview at this point, with what you would like to recommend to the full board 
uh, for a re for a retention period. So let me ask this: Has there was it always four years? Has there ever been a time in Baltimore County a precedence that was created uh, where it was more than four years and then changed the four years? I believe actually it was three years um, prior oh. to. Uh, I believe that that was one of the prior retention periods, uh, and then it was changed to four years. Uh, but I believe prior to the ethics um, regulation being uh, put in place, it was three. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I had a question related to the, um, excuse me, uh, the financial disclosure statement files and their mm -hmm. retention um, time frame. So yes. there's there's nothing that would preclude the board from having a longer retention time frame. Is that Not correct? That's up to the board. That's correct, ma'am. And then it would be approved by the state archivist. Okay. And then with the um, you had answered a question from a board member about uh, addresses, and mm -hmm. it was uh, brought to my attention and I appreciate you saying the new language. Um, would it be possible to have language to redact information from past financial disclosure statements, or is that not possible because they're uh, already approved by the Maryland State Archives? Okay, so you're asking two different questions. So the archivist um, is the individual who would approve the retention period in our retention schedule. The SEC, the State Ethics Commission, would approve the policy itself, so uh, different agency. And if your question is whether or not we can redact um, addresses that were uh, prior to 2019, January 1, 2019, with respect to public employees, uh, the home address of a public employee is not public information. That, so those we've always redacted. Uh, with respect to um, board members and candidates for members of the board, I'm just not remembering what our prior practice is. But my guess is that our prior practice was not to redact prior to January 1, 2019, because that's when the statute was changed. Okay, thank you. And it was brought to my attention that on some of the forms, if there are minor children that are um, engaged in certain activities, whether it might be uh, a job or an internship or um, even uh, coaching a team, um, that they would be uh, required to be on the form. Um, but would their information be available to be redacted because other board policy prevents the board from sharing uh, personally identifiable information about students? So again, different statute um, and, and different uh, governing uh, statutes and regulations. So as I said, for um, the home address of a public employee, the Public Information Act indicates that that is not public information. Uh, for the home address of a student being provided, the school system would have no way of knowing, and the ethics panel, I'm sorry, the ethics panel would have no way of knowing that a particular um, individual who is mentioned is a student who would be subject to other statutes. So if there is a request to redact, then that request um, will be evaluated by the ethics panel if there is then a request for release of records. And I'll use myself as an example. Uh, prior to um, it being clear in the, the statute, which was 2019, so I've been filing financial disclosures for a long time. So let's say in, it was a good 15 years ago, I specifically requested that my home address not be released if there was a request to view my financial disclosures. So that was my specific request 
when I filed my financial disclosures. Again, if if the uh, the filer believes that there is another statute that controls, then uh, the filer can provide us with that inform or can provide the ethics panel, excuse me, with that information so the ethics panel is aware when a request comes. And then the ethics panel would be able to indicate um, whether or not the information has been redacted because when a request is made to review a financial disclosure, I believe the way the form is now is there's a little check off on the financial disclosure form. If you want to know, if you want to be notified when your financial disclosures uh, are viewed by an individual and they are public documents. Okay. Thank that you help for that explanation. That's, that's helpful. You're welcome. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you. Yes, that was very helpful. Um, did we have any questions from any other board members? Okay. All right, do we need to now vote on this, Ms. Howie? Yes, um, again, if there is another period that the, uh, that the board wishes, that the panel, the, the, policy, the policy review committee wishes, you're perfectly able to, um, to provide that information uh, and to provide that in a motion, but what staff wanted to do was to do as much research as possible to see what other LEAs were doing and again what the county was doing for its uh, financial disclosure statements. So okay. it's it's complete within the board's uh, purview is what you want to do. Okay. Oh, it looks like there's a question. Um, Mr. Thomas. Yes, thank you. Um, when this was sent back to uh, us for further discussion, was there any recommendations for what the financial disclosure or disclosure term maybe should be from the group that recommended that we review it again? The specific motion was that PRC further discuss and consider language related to the retention of financial disclosure forms. That was the motion. I believe that the motion made in committee was that they be uh, retained for 10 years, but there was not a specific motion made um, in the board meeting in uh, on, Mar on I'm sorry, April 20th. Okay, thank you, Ms. Howie. Thank you. Any additional questions? Um, and I had a question. Um, I just wanted to understand uh, Ms. Howie, if, if I could, that we, do we still have a ban on like disposing? Um, we do. Okay, that, so that's still imposed since January 19th. And yes. so if we increase um, this retention schedule um, and, and the financial disclosures, are they only electronic or also, also are they in paper? No, we don't have any uh, financial disclosures that are electronic. Um, the financial disclosures. They're all in paper? That, yes, ma'am. The ones that are filed with the ethics review panel uh, have to be printed out and signed and filed um, as hard copies with the ethics review panel. There are no, there's nothing in the cloud or nothing um, that is, uh, that was, uh, has ever been as far as what's filed, uh, unlike the state, which does allow electronic filings, there are no so, electronic filings with. Uh, so they're all services. like piled up somewhere and. We're in a file cabinet. In file cabinets, if we increase it to 10 years, though, I guess I'm just envisioning we'll have to get trailers and things because this would be for everybody that has to file. Well, to the extent that there is currently a ban, um, the 10 year period doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't affect current operations because we're not uh, permitted under the board's ban to dispose of anything, whether record or non record, with the exception of schools and CNI. Okay. This just sounds like something that could add more paper. Um, so, okay. Um, goodness. Uh, yes, it looks like there's a motion from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to extend the retention period to 10 years. Is there a second? Okay, so hearing none. Um, 
I guess we could, uh, what we would do is then move on to process the motion with the information that you gave us as to accept it as presented. Is that correct? Uh, you can process it to, uh, given that the, the, it was sent back to discuss uh, further the retention period if there is further information that the committee wishes. But yes, in order to move the, the policy forward, uh, it would there would have to be a motion to move it forward as presented. Okay. This is Offerman. I'd like to move the. I, I would like to move the the uh, the uh, policy forward. As is. All right. I second Mr. Offerman's motion. When appropriate, I'd like to make a motion to amend his motion. Okay. So there's. Uh, an amendment to Mr. Offerman's motion. What is your amendment? Well, if Mr. Offerman wants to speak first to his motion. Well, I think you're, would it be appropriate to speak to the amendment that you just made? I didn't make an amendment. I, I, I forwarded Sorry, the motion Mr. Offerman, Ms. Causey's amendment to your motion. Okay. It's appropriate for her to speak to her amendment to your motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So I move to amend. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Howie, go right ahead. I do apologize. I do apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd forgotten you hadn't spoken to you. hadn't spoken your motion yet. My apologies. Yeah, she hadn't. <laughs> Thank you. I move to amend Mr. Offerman's motion to include asking staff to add language to provide information about requesting to redact. Okay. To make sure we clear, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really clear with that motion. As you, well, I guess we should discuss, I'll just repeat, you move, uh, you're making a motion for staff to add language to provide information about requesting to redact. Is there a second? Okay, so there's no second, so that, um, amendment fails. So now, Mr. Offerman, if you could please speak to your motion, if you care to, or we could just vote. I would. I, I would prefer that that we just vote. Okay. All right. So if we could vote on moving policy 8364 financial disclosure statement forward, that would be great. Ms. Causey. No. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Abstain. Ms. Scott. Yes. So the policy would move forward without recommendation. There's not a majority of the committee has voted. Okay, so the policy moves forward without a recommendation. Okay. If we could go yes. to the next one. Surely. Um, the yeah. next uh, the next item on the agenda simply has to do with internal business of the policy review committee. Just wanted the committee to be aware again of the policy review committee dates um, that have been placed on the calendar. Secondly, again, to present to the committee um, the policies that are scheduled to be reviewed for um, school year 21-22. And Mr. Thomas, for your information, policy 8130 requires uh, that the board review its own policies on a seven year basis. But last year there were policies that were requested both by the committee and by the board that they'd be placed on the agenda for review this year as well as, as I said, last year. So policy 3250 was requested by staff, even though it's not on the second the seven year schedule uh, policy 1270 is an annual review policy 8315 was uh, sent back to committee last year uh, policy 8364 which we've just done was a holdover from last year so uh, the board the prc uh, every year sees the the list but you see it at the end of the year, just wanted to bring it back to the committee's um, attention. And then finally, uh, or not finally, 
but then the policy review editing conventions. Um, this is to make sure that all of the policies that are presented to you uh, look the same, that uh, there is a standard uh, way that we present to you. What we do want to make you aware of, however, is that based on some of the recommendations from Public Works, what we'll be trying to incorporate as well, not necessarily in the editing conventions, but in what we bring forward to you for review, is when those policies, when the recommended changes, have some sort of reference in the Public Works um, analysis, We'll also make sure that the committee is aware of that. And as a matter of fact, we would like to devote most of next month's meeting to talking about specifically the indexing uh, that Public Works has recommended. And finally, you have um, this is what makes the heart of a bureaucrat happy. The approval tree uh, for policies uh, that is provided to you as well. Again, to simply remind members of the committee who are aware of this as you've served um, multiple years on this committee, but also to make sure that Mr. Thomas has for his reference uh, information on the committee. And with that, uh, that was, as I said, provided for your information. OK, thank you. Any questions? Very thorough. Looks like, oh, yes, Mr. Offerman. If we could go back to the uh, the uh, I'm sorry, if we go back to the uh, uh, part D in this, the approval tree. Yes, sir. OK, uh, I'm looking at the end where we where where uh, the, the bottom part where it says superintendent's rule. Mm -hmm. It goes back into the policy manual and and board docs. Mm -hmm. So superintendent's rule is given uh or is presented but it had but 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 it is not it is not reviewed by uh by the uh, board is that, is that correct it's not approved by the board that is correct but it's presented for your information and the uh the staff always waits until the policy is approved because it's possible uh that the policy can change and as a result that would mean that the rule might have to change so we bring the rule forward to make sure that uh, the board is aware that there is a rule that is related to a particular policy. And once it's presented uh, during that board meeting for information, then it is posted uh, in board docs on the policy manual and the policy and superintendent's rule manual. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, any other questions? Um, Ms. Colby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I um, I did have a question about the Public Works uh, recommendations, so I appreciate Ms. Howie um, that she and staff have already uh, evaluated that. And so mm -hmm. um, my, my first question is, um, does do we need to make a motion as a committee that we agree to um, set a portion of the agenda aside for our next PRC meeting to discuss staff's analysis of public works? That's certainly up to the committee, but uh, Ms. Clark and I had discussed this uh, when the um, report was issued, that when we looked at the schedule, we thought that the next PRC meeting would be an appropriate time to present to the committee uh, what our suggested way forward would, would be which might include a change to the policy analysis, but more likely it will include a similar type of addendum. So the same way that there's an addendum now that addresses questions that are at board meetings, there would be an addendum that addresses how that particular policy uh, has responded to public works recommendations. Okay. Okay, thank you. So Madam sure. Scott, would we just do that by consensus, agree that it sounds like that's what they're already going to be presenting to us, unless I heard that wrong, Ms. Howie. No, ma'am, that's what we plan to devote a significant amount of time next month uh, mm -hmm. to reviewing what our suggested responses were and to also getting your input 
um, based on your discussions with your publics and your constituents. I mean, one of the things, for example, that Public Works has recommended is that we look at indexing. So we want to know what is um, obscured, for example, and whether or not those are the sorts of issues you've heard from your public. Um, again, I'm, I'm a bureaucrat. It makes sense to me, but if it doesn't okay. make sense to parents, students, and teachers, then it's not helping. So what can we do to make it more helpful and more accessible uh, that's what uh, that's that would be our goal, and we would depend on your uh, input to give us guidance as to how to go forward and what is most accessible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, if it's appropriate, I would like to um, move that we add a meeting to April of 2022. Is there a second? Uh, second, Thomas. Okay. And I have a question. Um, why is there no meeting in April? Is there a reason why that was left off? Sure. The traditional reason has been because that's when uh, the board leaves for NSBA. I don't know what NSBA's plans are this year as to whether or not they'll be doing it in person. But that's usually conference uh, your conference month. So again, it's certainly up to um, to PRC if that's something you wish not to do. Mm. Okay, and NSBA, I, yeah, that is um, in April. Okay, Ms. Coffey, did you care to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. Um, Yes, there's a, a lot of work that policy review committee does, um, and it, it does seem that, especially with the pandemic and the ransomware attack, that there were a lot of um, disruptions, but also a, several more issues that needed to be addressed as we, you know, work through issues and um, especially with the pandemic, um, with different policies that that could be um, clarified or strengthened, um, knowing now what we did not know then um, also um, given public works recommendations um, i just feel like there's additional work to be done and i just would hope that staff could um, if the committee decides um, that staff could find a, a time that would not interrupt uh, an sba or um, sometimes spring break. spring break yes thank you sure mm -hmm. hi um sounds like a lot to put into one meeting in April. Um, looks like there's a question from Mr. Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I am in support of having a meeting in April, you know, trying to figure out a time that doesn't interfere with NSBA or uh, with Spring Break, just because um, I only have very few of these PRC meetings to serve on uh, for my year as student member of the board. I don't want to miss one in April, um, and that, that's kind of the reason I'm here. I want to make sure I can have as much impact as possible. So I am in full support of having a meeting in April. I would love one in the other month off as well, but maybe that's a little too much. So a April, uh, I'm in full support of having a meeting then. Okay. All right, Ms. Clark, if you're there, if we could take a vote on Ms. Colsey's motion to um, have a, a, an additional meeting in April. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. There's a tie, the motion fails. Okay, so will it come to the, well then I guess now do, uh, will it come to the board um, without a recommendation or? It just fail. No, it's just your schedule, so it would not go okay. forward. So members of the committee, the next policy for your consideration is AT210, which was scheduled for review during this school year, and it establishes procedures for the election of the chair and vice chair of the board. Um, the policy has just been revised to comply with the policy editing conventions. Um, however, there was a request from Ms. Joes that we also add language uh, for your consideration and discussion uh, that would prohibit 
uh, one individual from running from multiple offices. Uh, we have researched that to see whether or not there's a prohibition in any other local board policy. There is not. Uh, there's also uh, the, the closest corollary that exists is in election law that simply indicates that you can only run for one office. Uh, there's also um, in the education article with respect to this local board that an individual board member cannot serve on a state central committee. But as to within a particular assembly, so a council or a board, there is not, as I said, for um, local boards in the state, there's not a prohibition. Uh, but this was asked to be brought forward for your discussion. So we're simply bringing it forward as requested for your discussion. And those were the only um, the only changes that you'll see in the policy itself. We did make sure that um, the legal references were updated and that is the extent of what's being presented to you today. Thank you. Ian, just for my clarification, it's very short and I see it's in red, um, C. Mm -hmm. It says a person may not run for more than one position or office during an election. So that means, uh, if I understand right, if you're running for chair, you can't also run for vice chair or vice versa. Is, is that a correct interpretation? That is what I understood Ms. Joseph's purpose to be. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, oh, this came from Ms. Joseph. Okay. And then also, um, did you find any precedents for this at any other boards or um, does any other? No, ma'am. Okay. Were there any boards, I guess, that were similar to ours um, in that um, the way our elections have been in the past or? Um, having none? Okay, so we're unique. <laughs> we, we're unique in that our research was restricted to whether or not there were other local boards or other governmental bodies that indicated that during elections for officers that an individual member was uh, limited to uh, only running for only one office. It's the closest corollary of state election law. Okay. All right. Looks like there's a question from or a comment from Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, so say there was an individual who was running for vice chair, or, or sorry, for chair, and they did not win the election for chair, and then they could not run for vice chair. And that's what this policy is stating as well. That's the way I understood the um, request to be yes sir okay and does this policy in any way prohibit uh future student member of the boards from running for a vice chair or chair positions doesn't address uh student members of the board the question that i think would exist for student members of the board uh, would be whether or not an individual is even eligible given that an individual doesn't have the full right to vote. That's number one. And number two, whether or not the Howard County case uh, for which a decision is expected in the spring would in any way uh, restrict an individual student member's rights. As you know, Anne Arundel County uh, for many years, at least 30 years, has been the only LEA in the country for which a student member has had full voting rights. Uh, so, uh, but given the restricted number of months that a student member serves, um, I would be concerned that the student member would be vulnerable to challenge, again, particularly in light of the Howard County case. Okay. okay, and so the issue for possibly a student member not being in a term for vice chair or chair uh, would come from the not having full voting rights, uh, the inability to vote on certain things. And so would that restrict like what a student member would be exposed to and that would be what interferes with the officer it, positions? The way I would interpret it uh, yeah. would be that a student member of the board 
who is not an individual who at this point has the right to vote on every item, uh, that indicates to me that that member's rights are restricted in some way. So as being elected to uh, a leadership position, while it would be up to the full board, the question is whether or not the full board has the authority to make that decision. Uh, the second concern I would have is that the student member of the board doesn't serve for the full year. So the student member of the board would no longer be eligible to serve as of July of the following year uh, of the individual's term. So given that the student member couldn't serve that full term, again, I, th I think that would make vulnerable and um, open to challenge whether or not the student member has the authority or the ability, I should say, to even be elected. Okay, thank you, Ms. Howie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that, Ms. Howie. And it looks like we have a comment from uh, Ms. Jose. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott, um, for indulging me since I'm not in the PRC. But um, the reasoning for that uh, came through because in real life, you can't run for two positions when you're running for elections. You can't run for one and then you lose and you run for the other. And it's also for future boards, so we diversify and we have new people that are willing to run for office. And I actually looked through trying to find a board similar to ours that was that divided. And I couldn't, I uh, looked through, we have 9,000 school boards in the, in the US and we've had a de facto chair. We've had a de facto vice chair for the past two years. And that almost is unprecedented. So we would be, people would be looking to the Baltimore County School Board for if they ever were to come into that situation, like we've actually become precedents now. So my issue for, or, or not really the issue, the reasoning I put that is also for future boards in case, since this is the first time we've had a hybrid board, was it to be that situation that new people would would come in and run for um, two positions and it wouldn't be just the same um, people cycling through the uh, chairmanship and officer um, position so we, you would have kind of new blood coming in through there because it is a diverse board. So that was my reasoning for it. It wasn't directed towards any particular individual, but it was really policies are made for uh, the long haul. It was also for the next board that comes in. Um, you know, possibly I would say 80% of the board would not be there in the next board that comes in in 2023. So that was the reasoning for it. And, you know, just to make it more uh, democratic in the process as well. So thank you. Ian, thank you for that, Ms. Jost. That looks like we have a question now from Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I was wondering, did board council have an opportunity to review this iteration of the draft policy? No. Did, um, was input um, requested from MABE, Maryland Associations of Boards of Education? We have never asked MABE for input. If that is what the committee wishes to um, include in procedure, we're happy to do so. Okay, thank you. And um, I had um, developed some um, language that um, that I provided to the board a, a year ago, I believe, um, that I would have, um, that I would like to present to um, the committee or if the committee votes to move this forward, um, that I would be um, emailing to present to the full board um, for their consideration. Um, and I apologize, I do have a hard stop and I'm sorry if you all heard my alarm, um, but I wouldn't support this policy as is at this point. I, I think it would be helpful to have clarification in order to develop a um, specific policy so there aren't, um, so that there aren't questions or concerns um, and also that would make it a more collaborative and um, um, process within the board. So those are my comments at this time. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so uh, are there any other questions or comments from board members 
And I do recognize that we are coming up on time. Thank you for reminding us of that, Ms. Causey. Um, okay. If not, then um, was there, do we need to make a motion or can we just bring it to a vote? So uh, there are a couple ways to go forward. The, the language is brought forward for discussion. Uh, okay. You have started to discuss. I haven't heard whether or not there is necessarily a consensus of the board as to this language. Uh, if there is something else that the committee wishes discussed with respect to this concept, uh, then uh, as you're well aware, members of the committee, you amend all the time. It's mm -hmm. certainly not set in stone. So if this is something you want to see again to discuss further this concept and to discuss further how to make sure that your elections are run in a particular way, you're certainly able to do that. I would remind you, however, that your elections are in December. Yeah. So if that's this what is I'm something thinking. that you want to have happen, it would have to have happened sooner as opposed to later. So that if there's new procedure, if there's new procedure you wish to implement, you're able to do that prior to your elections in December. Okay. So then I oh it looks like there's a comment from Mr. Offerman. I'd like to move the I'd like to move uh, excuse me. I'd like to move this forward as is. Thank you. So it's a motion second. to do that. I second Mr. Offerman's motion. Okay. Uh, there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Yes. Thank you. Um, in reviewing the policy analysis, and again, I thank um, staff for putting this together and they're uh, laying out the points from other Maryland boards. Um, several of them are elected in order, chairman, vice chairman. And I guess I'm curious if that is in fact, because there may be candidates for chair that are not elected, uh, but then would wish to um, nominate themselves or be not or would be willing to be nominated by others. And there's um, nothing to say that those wouldn't be all new members to leadership. So um, I would want that. Re I personally will be reviewing that more and I'm not going to um, support moving it forward with a recommendation at this time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. I think uh, in any sort of election that we have, whether this is a school-based election, you're running for class president, whether you're running for national president, um, you're running for one position. And when you get that position, that's the position that you have. If you don't win that position, well, then you didn't win that position. And so uh, I am in support of the way that it's written right now. I think that you should run for the position you're intending to be, um, and, and that should be how our officers are selected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Okay, Ms. Um, Clark, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So now it moves on to the full board with the, um, uh, as it is with the language. Okay. So. All right. Sorry, go ahead. Surely, thank you, members of the committee. Um, the last two policies, 8501 and 8500, mm -hmm. have to do with evaluations. First, board self-evaluation, which is policy 8501, and the superintendent's evaluation, which is, uh, which is, I'm sorry, the flip, <laughs> board evaluation, which is policy 8500, superintendent's evaluation policy 8501. Um, there were recommendations in um, the public works report about uh, strengthening your self-evaluation and also about with respect to the superintendent's evaluation, including a quarterly report um, back to the board. Given that there are specifically recommendations about these two policies, that are in the public works um, report that we were unaware of when we prepared the drafts, we would like to bring these back to the board. Uh, we do or bring these back to the committee. Uh, we haven't yet heard what the process is that the committee will be using for um, 
analyzing and incorporating the public works recommendations, but we did not want this to sit outside of that process and certainly wanted this to be consistent with the way that the, the board is considering the other public works recommendations. So with that, we would ask that it be postponed um, until such time as there is a firm process from the board for incorporating and analyzing other public works recommendations. Okay, and when you say postponed, um, is there a, I guess we'll know, well, I guess when would the postponement be until, <laughs> or is that something we would decide or? That's why I uh, have left it open-ended. Otherwise I would suggest next month, but I don't know if by next month, by the, the next um, committee meeting, there will be a clear um, container, if you will, to put all the policies and all the recommendations in so that it's clear to everyone how all of these are integrated. Again, I would not want 8500 and 8501 to stand outside of any sort of analytical framework that is designed for the review of public works recommendations concerning the board. So uh, I would, uh, you can certainly say no later than a particular date or no later than let's say December. It would seem to me that's, that's uh, adequate time, uh, but I don't know what the process is and I don't know who the board has designated to review uh, comprehensively all of the recommendations concerning the board's operations. Okay, um, so that's what uh, the vice chair and I are working towards. And so I see now why you have it open-ended because we have not given a um, discuss to have a hard deadline yet. So um, is that something that we could put on to revisit at our next um, sure. meeting? Okay, because I think we should revisit it because we um, intend to give updates based okay. on the recommendations, um, specific to board operations and how this falls into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were there any concerns or questions um, from any other members of the committee? No? Okay. Okay. Then we can go to the next one. Is there anything else? That's Hello? it. Great. Thank you so much. All right. And so the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern, concern that anyone may have. We have to emphasize though that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meeting Act. So are there any issues of concern? Um, Ms. Causey? No, I believe she's left. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Thomas? There are no issues, but I just wanted to thank you all for a great first PRC meeting. <laughs> thank you for joining us. All right, and the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for October 18th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. So because there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, committee members. Have a good evening.